come again to our son, the book of Jeremiah. So rich, so fruitful, so full of illustrations that help us to understand God's purposes for our lives. Now, we are going to uh, look at a very interesting, uh, shall I say, excerpt from this book. And we're entitling it, The Marred Girdle. Let us explain. You see, we're in the time just before the complete destruction of Jerusalem. We have as a king, Jehoiakim. Oh, Jehoiakim was a very wicked man. And uh, even to the rejection of the prophecies that Jeremiah was giving by the word of the Lord, he took the he took the parchments that Baruch, the secretary of Jeremiah, had indeed written upon, because this is how prophecies were given. Prophecies were given by the prophet. He would be standing or sitting, and he would be speaking the word of the Lord. He would have a secretary. And Jeremiah had a secretary whose name we know, Baruch. Well, Baruch, you know, would hear Jeremiah prophesying. And so he would write down that prophecy on parchment in those days. And this parchment that Baruch had written upon was given to the princes of uh, Judah at that time. And they were very concerned with the awesome and dire warnings that this parchment contained because it was warnings of God's judgments upon the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah because of all their wickedness God said that he would bring Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, against them. Well, in haste, the princes brought these parchments to the king. The king was sitting in front of a log fire. It was cold. He was warming himself. And uh, the princes read the parchment one leaf after another and gave them to the king the king mocked them he mocked them and he took a penknife we're told and he cut that parchment to pieces threw it into the fire and the princes pleaded with him oh don't do that don't do that please don't do that Reverence the word of the Lord. But Jehoiakim did not. Why did Jehoiakim not do that? Well, there's a scripture that tells us wicked works alienate the mind. You know, one thinks, oh, if I do something wrong, it doesn't really matter. I've done it wrong, carry on. Oh, no. When we do things wrong, it changes our mind. It changes our mind. It changes our personality. It changes our heart. It changes the ability to do good and to receive admonition. Our hearts become hardened through wicked works indifference, and the like. And so we reject the word of God. Jehoiakim, well, he loved wickedness. And we're told he was a drunkard. A drunkard, a wicked man, an adulterous man, who did not care for his people, did not seek their well-being. He couldn't do. He was a wicked man. You see, his mind 
was alienated from his responsibilities as king. A king should be a father. A father's responsibility is to care for his family and to make sure that they are clothed and fed and sheltered and that the atmosphere in the home is joyous and peaceful. But you see, not only does a house take on the atmosphere of the father, if the father is tempestuous, angry and so forth, that kind of spirit fills the house and the whole family takes on that disposition. Well, when it comes to a king, and a king is angry, the king is adulterous, the king is drunken, that just fills the whole nation with drunkenness. And so you see, they took on the character of their ruler. And that so often happens, you see, in a nation, that a nation takes on the character of their ruler. Well, here he was. He was cutting up the parchment. He was despising the word of God, despising those prophecies, and he rejected them. Well, they didn't have computers in those days, but they did have a God who could repeat himself. And when Jeremiah heard that the king had cut up these prophecies, well, the anointing of God came upon Jeremiah, and those prophecies were repeated, taken down by Baruch, and conserved for us unto this very day. God is not mocked. Well, the king was so angry, you know, with the prophecies, he wanted to take Jeremiah and Baruch captive. But God hid them. And that's a wonderful thing. God can hide us from trouble. We're told in the Psalms that God can hide us from the strife of tongues. Oh, you know, sometimes people talk against us, you know, and it can cause us great distress. But you know, God can hide us from those tongues so that we don't hear them. We don't know what people are saying against us. And the result is we have peace and joy in our hearts. Well, for Jeremiah and Baruch, it was even more important because their lives were at stake. But you know, God can protect us in times of danger. We have been protected in times of earthquakes. We have been protected in times of civil war. We have been protected, you know, in driving cars, having a fantastic experience of an angel putting his hand upon our wheel and turning it to avoid an accident that we could not avoid. Yes, God hides us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But we want to come back to our original title of the marred girdle. It was necessary that we consider the situation in uh, Judah at this time because it helps us to understand the illustration of the marred girdle. Well, what was it? God spoke to Jeremiah the prophet and he said, take a linen girdle. You know, a belt, we could say, a linen belt. Put it around you and then go from Jerusalem right up to the shores of that great river, Euphrates. And that was a very long journey. Don't forget, on those days they went on foot and that could have been something over a hundred miles. And so Jeremiah faithfully went and buried, as God told him to, this girdle, took it off him, buried it in the shores of the Euphrates River. And he returned to Jerusalem. After many days, God said, go and 
get that girdle back. Well, Jeremiah made the long walk up to the river Euphrates again and he got the girdle. He looked at that girdle and it was good for nothing. Absolutely good for nothing. It was marred. It became the marred girdle. And God said, so is the nation of Judah, Israel, in my sight. That girdle is good for nothing. They are good for nothing because of all their sins, <clears throat> starting with the king and with his, the evil princes. They were good for nothing. Now, I want to look at this a little bit more carefully with you. You see, that illustration could have been given very easily by God saying to Jeremiah, take that girdle, bury it in the shores of Jordan, because Jordan was only a few miles away, perhaps 20 at the most. And uh, he could have gone there, and that illustration would have been good. But God had said, go to the river Euphrates. Now, what was the significance there? Well, the river Euphrates forms the northern boundary of Israel. And that boundary is the boundary between Israel and the northern powers or the northern nations. And you see, God had spoken at the beginning in Jeremiah chapter 1 of the fact that trouble would come from the north. And so what God was saying, look, this marred girdle, you know, buried in the shores of Euphrates, in actuality is saying this, that the country is going to be ruined by the powers from the north. And that indeed is exactly what happened. But I want to consider some of the other factors of that which God spoke. You know, we have already spoken of the wicked king that was upon the throne at this time, Jehoiakim. And we've also said that he was noted for drunkenness. In fact, there's a description in the word of God concerning this wicked king that the uh, princes, his evil counselors, would indeed give him bottle after bottle and make him drunk. They enjoyed seeing the king drunk. And this is exactly what happened. But God now goes on to say, look, the king, yes, is drunken. But he said, I'm going to fill the whole city of Jerusalem with drunkenness. It is something that is very interesting as you study God's word. God uses drunkenness for his purpose. He smites people with drunkenness as judgment. I want to look at the nations first of all. He speaks concerning Jerusalem, that he will smite it with drunkenness. That meant that when the forces of the enemy came, that the soldiers would be drunk. In fact, they cried out, you know, let us drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And God says, you know, that sin will never be erased from you throughout eternity. You know, here is danger. And God was saying, well, look, danger's coming. Why don't you cry out to me and change your ways that I might drive off the northern power? that I might preserve you. No, the people were so wicked that when they saw the enemy coming, they said, oh, we're going to die, so let us drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
And you know, that's often the case of some. You know, they drink and drink and drink, and they drink themselves into poverty and ruination of the family. Instead of coming to their senses and repenting before God and say, God, take away this drunkenness from me. Well, that's what God did to Jerusalem. But also, you know, God, in his foreknowledge, speaks not only of Jerusalem, but he speaks of the power that afflicted Jerusalem, and that was Babylon. And for Babylon, he says this. He says, I will fill that city with drunkenness. Now, this is very interesting. Babylon was almost an impregnable city. And uh, it had moats around it from the Tigris, Euphrates rivers. It had moats around it, and it was thought to be impregnable. But God filled Babylon with drunkenness. We see the record of it in Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, we see the night before Babylon is taken, that the king, Belshazzar, is indeed having a great feast for a thousand of his lords and ladies. And they were drinking, they were mocking the vessels of God. Yes, the whole city was filled with drunkenness so that the invading Medes and Persians could get under the gates and take the city and kill all the people who were impotent, if I could say that. They could not fight because of drunkenness. God uses drunkenness as judgments. You know, when a man is drunk, he cannot make sound judgments. He cannot make sound judgments. And, uh, you know, this is one of the ways that God deals with people who have walked away from him and who have mocked him, he sends them to the tavern. And there in the tavern, they drink and drink and they drink themselves into poverty. And so often, what happens, they come out of the tavern and they fight. And people have been murdered coming out of the tavern. Yes, I've had such cases to deal with myself that uh, I've been phoned up, oh, so-and-so's murdered a person. And where do they murder them? Out of the tavern. Yes, from drunkenness there comes immorality. So often drugs, so often as they go down into homosexuality, Yes, from drunkenness springs many, many sins, many heartaches. Oh, how many women do I know, wives do I know, who say my husband is a drunkard. You know, he drinks and drinks and drinks and drinks and drinks. And the result is, you know, they find difficulty in uh, keeping a job. They put their family into jeopardy. And you know, drunkenness has a product of being foul-mouthed. And they say all kinds of unkind things against long-suffering wives. Drunkenness is a judgment from God that comes upon those who do not walk in his ways. And so it was, you see, here in Jerusalem at this time, filled with drunkenness, filled with drunkenness. And so this girdle, it was a marred girdle. It was good for nothing. God says, they're good for nothing. I can do nothing with them. Is that going to be your life? You know, they say after you have died, well, his life meant nothing. He caused a lot of pain. 
to his family, a lot of sorrow to his family. He was good for nothing. Do you know that Jehoiakim, the king at that time, you know, his burial was like the burial of a donkey. And do you know this, that there was an epitaph, if I could say this. You know, he departed undesired. Undesired. No friends, no companions mourned him. He departed undesired. You know, I've known people like that. You know, I attended one funeral of a man who really spent his life in taverns. And he, interestingly enough, he had a little nickname that people gave him. He was called the Frog. And uh, I attended his funeral. I had never met him, but I heard of him. And I heard of him from many people. And the testimony was say, the same. You know, his life was without purpose. It had accomplished nothing. Do you know the remarkable thing? He was divorced. And yet his wife still loved him, but did not like him. You know, marriage is very binding. So often, even the most reprobate husbands are still loved by their wives, though not liked. Well, his wife loved him still, but they had been parted for so many years. But the funeral took place. And I attended the funeral. I was asked to attend the funeral. I attended the funeral. You know, I've been in many funerals. And here in this funeral home, when the funeral was taking place, I tell you this, there was a clammy atmosphere in that funeral home. You felt that's where the frog had gone down into. The clamminess of hell. You know, Peter calls it the mist of darkness. The mist of darkness. Yes, that's the end of those who are like marred girdles. Good for nothing. Their life spent in such a way that their epitaph is they were no longer desired. No one desired them. No one desired them. Even his wife loved him but did not desire him. Did not want to see him again. He had caused her so much pain. But, oh, praise the Lord. You know, your life does not have to be like that. Your life can be so different. Why do you have to be a marred girdle? Why can't you be the girdle that was in good condition before it went in to the sands of the Euphrates River? You know, what caused the girdle to be marred was where the girdle was placed. The girdle was perfectly sound before that. But it was where the girdle was placed that caused it to be marred, undesired, fit for nothing. You see, this is the problem. Where are you placed? You might have started life perfectly good, perfectly sound. You are a good girdle, a good girdle. You know, to do the purpose for which you were created, you're good. But then... You go into a place that mars you. You join with people that are evil. And you know, one of the most favorite scriptures of my wife was this. Evil companionship mars good manners. You see, where we are changes our disposition, changes our character. 
And I'm going to plead with you as we finish now. I'm going to plead with you. Consider your ways. Consider where you are. The environment in which you are at the moment. That will cause you to be corrupted. That will cause you to be marred. That was the problem with the girdle. The girdle was fine. It was where it was placed. That indeed ruined it. And I'm pleading with you as we, you know, come to a close in this lesson. I'm pleading with you, you know, consider your companions. What companions are they? Are they going to mar you? Or are they going to make you? Are they going to make you bitter, horrible, lead you into drunkenness? Or are they going to make you better? You see, the girdle, if it had not been placed there, would have been perfectly right. You perhaps are in a place that you should not be. And that place, the atmosphere of that place is going to mar you. I plead with you. Consider this. The girdle was okay until it was placed in that ground. And maybe that can be your salvation in realizing where you are placed will determine your eternity. May God grant that you be surrounded by good people, good companionship, people who walk in the ways of God, people who will strengthen you and encourage you that you will hit the mark of God's high calling for your life. God bless you.